Let's see how good a job Professor Zarneski has done in warming you up. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Good One shot. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Zarneski, and good evening to you all. I'm Horace Anderson, uh, Dean of the Elizabeth Howe School of Law at Pace University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this year's Lloyd K. Garrison Lecture on Environmental Law. We are honored to have Professor Rebecca Bradsby's deliver the lecture this year. She's the founding director of the Center for Urban Environmental Reform at CUNY Law School. And she is no stranger to us here at the law school. Now, I thought that I would be saying that because she's been um, visiting here and has been our how visiting scholar this semester. But then as I saw her hugging people around the room as we were waiting to start, people that I didn't know she knew, I, I have come to understand she's not a stranger to anyone in this room. Um, we've been so thrilled to have her uh, here with us this year, and uh, we're looking forward to a great talk. Let me give you a little bit of background uh, on the Garrison Lecture. Uh, the Garrison Lecture was established in 1995 in memory of Lloyd Garrison, a noted lawyer, champion of civil rights and civil liberties. Nearly 60 years ago, Lloyd Garrison and his associate, Albert Butzel of Paul Weiss, Ripken, Wharton, and Garrison, won a landmark decision to preserve Storm King Mountain on the Hudson River. This victory for the scenic Hudson Preservation Conference did more than just safeguard that area of unique beauty. It inaugurated what today we recognize as the field of environmental law. Uh, now, embedded in the Second Circuit's decision in that case are many bedrock concepts that many of us in the room are familiar with. Question of standing in court proceedings for the purpose of pr protecting nature. Citizen suit legislation. Uh, the environmental impact statement process. And the balancing of economics with the preservation of scenic beauty and historic resources. The Garrison Lecture celebrates the vision, public spirit, and life of this attorney and aims to inspire all those who follow in his pursuit of environmental protection using the law. Professor Bratsby's you today you are joining an impressive list of distinguished lawyers, scholars, and leaders in the field of environmental law who have delivered the Garrison Lecture, uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. Now I'm going to sit down and ask Professor Achinthi Victanage, Associate Director of Environmental Law Programs, to formally introduce Professor Bratz. All right, thank you, Dean Anderson. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So it is my great honor and pleasure for you, to introduce you to Professor Rebecca Bradsby's, who will be delivering today's Lloyd K. Garrison Lecture on Environmental Law. Now, Professor Bradsby's, as you heard, is a professor at CUNY School of Law. She's also the founding director of the Center for Urban Environmental Reform, which she established in 2011 to support and empower communities participating in environmental decision-making and attune environmental leaders to the urban environment. So in preparing my remarks for today, I was drawn to reflect on my first meeting with Professor Bradsby's, and I'm not sure she recalls it. So it was fall 2017. I had just arrived in New York from Australia for my LLM here at Hob Law, and somehow I had come across this flyer. And I suspect that was probably Professor Kim Q's doing um, for a conference, and it was for a conference hosted by the Center for Urban Environmental Reform, the very center that Professor, Ratz, Professor Bradsby's directs. So the conference was essentially reflecting on the impact of climate-related severe weather events like Superstorm Sandy and exploring those intersections of climate resilience with environmental justice communities. Professor Bradsby's, as one of the co-conveners of that conference, had put together this really outstanding and thoughtful agenda with very diverse and interdisciplinary experts and voices. It turned out to be my first and in-depth exposure to issues of environmental and climate justice issue, climate justice issues in New York City. And while our interactions were brief at that conference, Professor Bradsby's and the conference she developed certainly left a very memorable and positive impression on me, 
one that has only grown as I got to know her later as a colleague. So what is it about Professor Bradskis that leaves this kind of impression? Well, let me count the ways. So first of all, she's a well-known environmental justice scholar. Professor Bradsby's has written scores of law review articles, which have been published in a variety of prestigious publications, including our very own Pace Environmental Law Review. Her co-authored textbook, Environmental Justice, Law, Policy, and Regulation, is used in schools across the country. And in 2021, ABA's section on environment, energy, and resources honored her work with its commitment to diversity and justice award. Second, she is a human rights advocate through and through. You can just tell by what organizations choose to quote her on. In 2022, she, was there, she then received the Center for International Sustainable Development Laws International Legal Specialist for Human Rights Award. Third, she just happens to be a comic book author. <laughs> Professor Bradskis is possibly best known for the Environmental Justice Chronicles, her award-winning environmental justice comic books Maya's Lot, Venus Plant, and Troop Run, Troops Run, made in collaboration with artist Charlie Lagresca Velasco. In 2023, the EPA, the US EPA, decided that they were going to recognize this work with the Clean Air Act Award for Excellence in Education and Outreach. Fourth, she is a dedicated educator. Now, most folks know from her bio that Professor Bradsby's has been teaching property, climate change, environmental justice, administrative law, and environmental law at CUNY since 2004. What most don't know that is that since Professor Bradsby's developed those comic books, her center has worked and with nearly 1,000 New York City students and trained about 25 New York City public school teachers. The comic books are even being used internationally at universities in Canada, South Africa, United Kingdom, Indonesia, and Hungary. Fifth, she's an engaged member of the legal profession and academy. Professor Bradsby's is a member scholar with the Center for Progressive Reform and a board member of the Environmental Law Collective. She's a regular feature in law review symposiums and conferences around the country, including at Hoblaw's most recent Climate Constitutionalism Conference. Professor Bradsby's is a resident historian. Her most recent book, Naming Gotham, The Villains, Rose and Heroes Behind New York Place Names, won the New York Public Historian's 2023 Award for Excellence in Local History. Professor Bradsby's is also a committed and celebrated member of her community, a community that she regularly and thoughtfully brings together in conversation in her role as director of the Center for Urban Environmental Reform. In 2015, she received the Eastern Queen Alliance's Snowy Egret Award, where she was recognized for her leading the center's efforts to teach environmental justice to elementary school students in Astoria. She also serves on New York City's Environmental Justice Advisory Board. These are just a sampling of the truly impressive things that make up the incredible individual that is Professor Bradsby's. But most of all, and this is speaking personally, she is a mentor for young academics, a compassionate colleague, and a good friend, even letting me crash in her hotel room during a conference when I had hurt my back. There is no limit to her compassion, which explains her unwavering commitment to issues of environmental justice, human rights, and public health. Professor Bradsby's, Rebecca, while our community has had the good fortune of learning from you in your classes this semester, running into you in the hallways of Hob Law, and engaging with you at Hob Law events over the past semester, we're all the more eager to hear from you today and you have naturally chosen a topic that is both close to home and heart, mapping injustice, place, race, and the environment in New York City. I'm certain that tonight, Professor Bradsmees will provide an immeasurable learning opportunity for students, professionals, and anyone who calls New York City home. On behalf of Hob Law School, a warm welcome to you. Now, let me turn back to Professor Zaneski for the award. Thank you, uh, Professor Bethanage, for that wonderful introduction of our speaker. And now everyone can please join me in presenting the 2024 Lloyd K. Garrison Award to Rebecca, Rebecca Bradsby's. This medal 
uh, which you see on the screen above, displays a topographical depiction of Storm King Mountain. Paying homage to the landmark Second Certain Case of Scenic Hudson Preservation Conference versus Federal Power Commission, a ruling that inaugurated what we today call environmental law. The topographical rendering of Storm King also serves as the logo of the Pace Hub Environmental Law Program. Storm King is also the picture that we give to the, war, uh, the winners at our National Environmental Law Moot Court competition. This is so genius. So, um, uh, this award now bears Professor Bradsby's name on the back, and I invite her to come up here for this award. <laughs> So I now invite our distinguished guest lecturer, Rebecca, Professor Rebecca Brasby's to deliver the 2024 Lloyd K. Garrison lecture. Can I wear that? <laughs> <laughs> so hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out. I, I have to confess I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, I don't know what I expected, but I did not expect that unbelievably generous and loving introduction. So thank you so much. And I also didn't know there was metal involved. <laughs> so um, I, I'm so honored to be with you tonight. Um, as you heard, I write and teach about uh, New York City, about environmental justice and human rights. And my particular interest is on infrastructure and how the um, the way that we build our city impacts communities, and in particular, the the way that we distribute the benefits and the burdens among and between communities. And this is not my PowerPoint. Um, I I put the cover of my book on the first slide just because I wanted to emphasize to everybody in the audience that um, everything you do is grist for learning and for whatever else you do. And, you know, I, I would veer way out of my lane. I mean, my lane is pretty wide. I'm like comic books and law and this and that. But in writing a history book, I mean, I, I am not a historian. I definitely cosplay a historian, but I am not one. Um, but boy, did it change the way I think about the city and the way I think about law and the way I think about my work. So I just want to encourage you, like whatever your interests are, they're, they will feed your career if you let them. So, you know, pursue them, whatever they are. Um, I, I do want to start by acknowledging that we are on tradi the traditional land of the Wequasee people, uh, a Muncie-speaking band of, of the Wappinger. Um, they were the caretakers of this land for millennia. They were largely wiped out by Dutch and um, English settlers. This is 1685. Dutch map of the region. The star is, is roughly where we are, as close as I could make it. Um, you can see, right, that it is, maybe you can't see, um, Wiscogee Land. Um, right, land acknowledgements don't exist in the past tense. Colonialism is an ongoing process, and we are all participating. So I just wanted to take a moment to honor the many native peoples who were custodians of this land for millennia and who continue to thrive in and around the region today, and to recognize the need to build authentic relationships with these indigenous communities. Um, it's also worth noting that acknowledging the land is in and of itself an indigenous practice. Um, so this Dutch map from the 1680s is one representation of the reality of the land that we occupy. Here's another. Uh, the heart is where I live. And you can see white plains in red. And you can also see traces of the Lenape and the Wappinger in the names of Hackensack, um, Hoboken, um, Muncie, um, Massapequa, right? You can, and you can also see the highways, which we're gonna talk about in a bit. So I really like maps. And the theme for this talk is going to be maps and what they do. So when I was in college, I read a book uh, called How to Lie with Maps. And the thesis was 
that people think maps are neutral, they think maps are true, but they're really a very selective, incomplete representation of the world. And because any map is just one of an infinite array of possibilities of the way you can represent information. So the author's point was be careful. Maps can be misleading and maps can be propaganda, but you know, I'm, like, I'm not good at following directions, so I took a very different message from the book, and that was that maps can be a way um, to, uh, a tool for revealing truths that might otherwise be hidden. So I want to give you a couple of concrete examples of what I mean. This is a map you've probably all seen, right? It's 2020 election. Former president has used this map to claim he won in 2020 and that the election was somehow stolen. Now, that's a lie case you have any doubts, but this map gives some credence to it because it looks like most of the country voted for him, right? Or at least that it was very close. So this is the same map showing the same state geographic borders, but the color blocks have been adjusted to re reflect the number of electoral votes each state has. Same election, same national map, really different story. But land doesn't vote, people do. So let's look at a map designed to show us the vote by population rather than by state. Now notice to reveal certain, certain features like the population, we had to suppress other features like the ge geographic borders of the states. This map tells a markedly different story than either of the two maps I just showed. It, and it opens the door to a discussion about the unequal representation that the electoral college forces on us. So I live in Queens, right? Queens has 2.361 million people. That's as many people as Alaska, North Dakota, and South Dakota combined. But they have nine electoral votes. They have six senators. Let me tell you, if Queens had six senators, we'd have a very different country. <laughs> Um, so Alaska, North Dakota, and South Dakota have one electoral vote for every 271,000 people. New York has one electoral vote for every 703,000 people. Three maps, all true, telling three very different stories about the 2020 election and opening up the possibility of very different conversations. And that's really the theme that I want to um, emphasize today is that we can choose the stories that we tell. Um, so uh, as um, you heard, I work in schools around New York City, haven't really done this since COVID, but hoping to do it again. And this photograph is one of my favorites from one of the classrooms, right? These were sixth grade kids and they asked all of the key questions. Who has power? Whose stories are not being told? And who benefits from the stories that are being told? As lawyers, we tell stories and we can choose the stories that we tell. We can use our training and our talents to shine a light on injustice, to emphasize where law and regulation are not making things better, but are in fact making things worse that are creating structural barriers to equality or to justice. Or we can tell stories that normalize the status quo and obscure injustice. So with that preface, let's talk about New York. I wanna tell you some stories about environmental justice, which for those of you who don't know, has two rough components, right? Fair treatment, so a substantive outcome sense, and meaningful involvement, a procedural context. Um, so we're gonna look at some of the highly racialized inequality here where we live, um, how we got here and what we can do about it. As lawyers, identifying problems is only the start, right? Our job is to figure out how to move forward and how to solve problems, not just to point them out and say, oh, that's really a shame. So I wanna start in the 1890s, um, when Queens, Staten Island, and Brooklyn joined Manhattan and Bronx to create the city of the greater New York. By the way, this is the world that Lloyd K. Garrison was born into. He was born in 1897. Um, in 1890, according to the census, there were roughly a million and a half people in the greater New York area. So that was already double the population at the end of the Civil War. By the 1900 census, the population had doubled again to 3.4 million. 
The newly arrived were mostly poor European immigrants. In this map, you can see where they're clustered, right? Notice Ward 10, right? That was the most populous place on earth, according to the New York Legislature Committee that was investigating conditions there. And landlords realized that they could make a lot of money renting out shoddy housing to desperate immigrants. Immigrants were really, many of them were desperately poor as well as desperate for housing. But you know what? If you shove up enough of them together, it doesn't matter that they can't pay you very much. You just pile them up. And that's how we got the tenants. So what you see here is the evolution of single family housing into a tenement building. One city lot had been a home for one family, but over time it became a home for 24 families. No, wind, no light, no ventilation, no sanitation, narrow doors, narrow hallways, few windows, and rickety steps, maybe, maybe just a ladder. And this is what the legislature had to say about those conditions, right? If we take the death rate of children as a test, the rear tenement house show themselves to be veritable slaughterhouses. Um, I'll let you read the other one, right? In 1898, no one was talking about environmental justice. But they were concerned with the public health issues that emerged from this situation, from overcrowding, from lack of sanitation, particularly something that resonates quite a bit now, fear of contagious diseases. Um, typhoid, smallpox, cholera, tuberculosis, and in fact, Lloyd K. Garrison's father died of typhoid in New York. Um, and even more than the bad conditions, there was no way to escape in a fire. So every red dot you see there is a fire. Now think about a building with few windows, no ventilation, no real staircases, narrow hallways, no lighting, trying to evacuate in a fire. They were death traps. So, um, the photo that you see here, right, this was uh, one of the photos that Jacob Rees, uh, the reporter, included in his sort of groundbreaking study of tenement squalor called How the Other Half Lives. Reformers used the power of stories and the power of maps, some of which I just showed you, and to build a consensus for change. And the New York legislature responded in 1901 enacting the Tenement Act. The law required a window in every room, two means of ingress and egress, a door and a window. So maybe you have a possibility of getting out of fire. Required staircases. If it's a six story building, there has to be a staircase, a continuous staircase that goes up and down six stories. It has to be wide. The treads have to be big enough that you can step on them, right? The basic things that we think of now when we look at the implied warranty of habitability. That comes from the 1901 tenement. And it was part of a wider reform movement, and that is key. The story changed, people mobilized, and the law follows. The law rarely leads, the law frequently follows. And for those of you who drove here, if you've never wondered who Major Deegan was, he was a tenement commissioner, among other things, and he was tasked in the 1920s with enforcing the tenement laws. So where did this authority come from? Came from, the um, traditional common law doctrine of nuisance, right? The principle that limits the rights of property owners and navigates conflicts over uses. Reformers argued for a new reading of this old legal principle, that deplorable living conditions for immigrants in New York created a nuisance that burdened other people's ability to use their land. Now, this wasn't just novel, it was radical. It was a radical reinterpretation and expansion of the law of nuisance. But as material conditions changed, the story changed, and so did the law. Now notice the claim was not that these immigrants were, were entitled to clean air, clean water, and a healthful environment. Right? That took 2000, that took until 2022 when we amended our constitution to guarantee those rights. This was about, hey, if they're living in squalor, it's going to impact me, middle class person living nearby. But the goal wasn't just to get rid of tenements. The goal was to think about how can we provide affordable, safe housing for people who need it, which is, last I checked, 
sort of news number one in New York still. Um, so at the same time that the New York State was passing the Tenement Acts, New York City was grappling with another set of interferences. Um, and New York City was drawing on those same nuisance principles to create the first comprehensive zoning. Now it's the early 1900s, a combination of electricity, steel construction, and elevators allowed massive upward building. This is the equitable building, it was built in 1914, and it became a poster building, for lack of a better word, of the perils of unregulated development. It was a 38-story steel frame building that was built straight up from the lot lines without any setbacks. It was designed to put the most building on the lot that was possible. 1.85 million square feet of office space on less than an acre of land. And the equitable building, as a result, blocked ventilation in surrounding buildings, dumped 13,000 users on the nearby sidewalks, choked local transit, created fire hazards, and at noon, it cast a seven acre shadow. Now remember, remember many older buildings didn't have electric lights at this point. Seven acre shower, shadow was not just inconvenient, it was a real problem. So most of the surrounding property owners claimed a loss of rental income because of these impacts. And more importantly for the city, they filed tax abatements. They said, my building isn't worth as much. Now you've got the city's attention. Um, so the zoning law was the city's way of trying to be prospective, to plan by defining what constitutes a nuisance, um, to plan for development and to try to um, manage the conflicts that were arising. So I'm gonna focus on one aspect of zoning, uh, the segregation of uses, and just to give you a quick example. So um, Peter Cooper, who founded Cooper Union among other things, um, he made his first fortune having a slaughterhouse slash glue factory in Manhattan. Not really a very pleasant neighbor. And in the eight, in, so right after the Civil War, he was forced to move that from Manhattan to the Newtown Creek area in Queens, near where I live. Why? Because that area was already polluted. And so therefore it was a more suitable location for this locally undesirable land use for Lulu. So we're gonna come back to that idea over and over again. The idea that already polluted places are the logical place to locate even more polluting infrastructure. That's at the core of environmental injustice. So New York passes its zoning law, zoning starts to spread, and there's an almost immediate constitutional challenge. All of you who are property are like, oh, no one told me there'd be property on that. <laughs> right, so constitutional challenge, and to the surprise of many, the Supreme Court upheld comprehensive zoning. And Justice Cumberland, writing for the majority, wrote that a nuisance may be merely the right thing in the wrong place, like a pig in the parlor instead of the barnyard. He also, by the way, had some choice words about the negative impacts of apartments expressed in highly racialized terms. And harkened back to the fight over the tenements and was uh, sort of foreshadowing what would come next. So the Supreme Court had already outlawed racial zoning in 1917 in a case called Buchanan versus Worley uh, out of Louisville, Kentucky, which challenged laws that prohibited Black people from living on a block where the majority of the residents were white. The Supreme Court unanimously found this to be unconstitutional under the 14th Amendment and also found that it violated the Civil Rights Act of 1866. But that didn't mean that that racist segregationist impulse went away. It just got a boost somewhere else. So this is the 1936 uh, Federal Housing Authority underwriting manual. The highlighted language is where the FHA advised using highways to protect desirable neighborhoods from infiltration, that's their word, infiltration by adverse groups, including low, lower class occupancy and inharmonious racial groups. And the part where the arrow is, is just sort of to direct your attention, because it's again, the pig in the parlor idea. The, um, the FHA points out high-speed traffic arteries are a great tool to block the expansion of inharmonious uses, but in a desirable neighborhood, this same road with its same noise, its same pollution, its same danger is an adverse um, impact rather than protection. Now, this is the federal government speaking. 
the same government that funded 90% of the cost of building the highways. Then two years later, we get this, right? The 1938 Homeowners Loan Corporation redline maps of New York City. So the HOLC was an agency. I know my administrative law students are here. It's an agency founded in 1933 to provide mortgage relief to more than a million homeowners at risk of losing their homes due to foreclosure during the Great Depression. These HOLC maps, and there are hundreds of them, are how the country defined which neighborhoods were Justice Cumberland's parlor, which ones were the barnyard, and which people belonged in which milieu. Areas labeled green were the best. Um, you can see there aren't very many roads in New York. Um, blue meant still desirable. And these are their words, right? Yellow equaled in decline. Then came the areas deemed hazardous, red. These maps dictated where the federal government would underwrite and insure loans and guided how the federal government steered private capital into and out of neighborhoods. Overwhelmingly, the agency labeled majority black neighborhoods as hazardous, red. The reports accompanying these maps were unambiguous. They explicitly referred to too many black people or too many Jews as a reason for a hazardous weight weighted. And this practice of redlining starved these neighborhoods of capital and the people who lived in them of investment and government services. And it underpinned urban poverty. And it remained legal until the Fair Housing Act of 1968. And we see its enduring effect today. So when you look at this map, what you're seeing is a map of structural racism, a map that cut black and brown Americans out of the New Deal and out of the prosperity that it built. Now, Robert Moses deployed roads as a weapon exactly as the FHA suggested. This is a before and after map of the Cross Bronx Expressway, which was built in, in 1948. The Cross Bronx disrupted the most integrated neighborhood in the country. It demolished thousands of apartments and hundreds of apartment buildings, displacing 60,000 people. That's more people than have ever been displaced in any infrastructure project ever. Now, white residents fled. They were lured to the racially restricted suburbs by the government-backed mortgages that the HOLC maps directed there, by scare stories, and by the new roads themselves. Black and brown residents, on the other hand, were mostly excluded from those opportunities to move. And it's the same story for the Major Deacon Expressway, the Bruckner Expressway, the Sheridan Expressway, the Van Wick, I could go on and on and on. These highways were literally routes of white flight paid for by tax dollars. And this is the legacy. This is a map of the noise burden along the highways that um, were built, right? By the way, over 85 decibels, um, for extended periods, not only causes permanent hearing loss, but also anxiety, cardiovascular disease, and a host of other health impacts. Uh, this is the asthma impact prevalence in those same neighborhoods. The darker the purple, the higher the asthma rate. So I want to show you this one next to the red line map. And if you look, do you see that white spot there? Look there. You can see that the red, that the red line area and the darkest purple coincide, right? You can see the clear correlation between redlining, the way the roads were built, and various pollution-related health burdens. This is a map of environmental injustice. If we pull back to the entire city, we see the clear legacy of these redlining maps for a multitude of environmental health issues. This is the heat vulnerability map. As the climate changes, the temperature rises. Not everybody's equally vulnerable, though, right? We're all going to have the 98 degrees, so some neighborhoods without trees and with lots of pavement are going to be even hotter. Um, but those most vulnerable are those in substandard housing, back to those tenements we started with, those without access to air conditioning, those with pre-existing medical conditions, right? We just talked about how pollution causes many of those. And um, you can see how closely this map tracks the red line neighborhoods. If we look at the food insecurity map, it's the same map, the same story. Here's the asthma map for the whole city. You can see the worst part of it is in the Bronx that we just looked at. Um, but childhood asthma across the city largely tracks those redlining maps. And childhood asthma is a proxy for pollution exposure. 
The same neighborhoods that were redlined, that are majority Black and Latinx today, that have the highest heat vulnerability, the most food insecurity, also have the child, highest childhood asthma rates. And this one is particularly troubling because childhood asthma is the strongest driver of days missed from school. And days missed from school are the best predictor for involvement in the criminal justice system. There's a direct link between pollution, environmental justice, injustice, and mass incarceration, particularly since the neighborhoods that are most overburdened are also the neighborhoods that were most targeted for um, over-policing and the unconstitutional stop and frisk policy. Now I could show you a lot more maps. Where are the power plants? Where are the waste transfer stations? Where are the waste water treatment plants? It will be the same map again and again and again. All of the Lulus are cited in poor communities. They're all cited in red line communities. The reason I'm showing you this map, all these maps, is to emphasize that this is not something natural or inevitable. None of this was by accident. Structural racism is rooted in public policies that created this system. We're not going to stop there. So I want to show you a map that was released last week that I'm very proud of. Um, this map is part of the environmental justice report and mapping tool that the um, city released a, a week ago. I have the honor of sitting on the Environmental Justice Advisory Board that advised the city as they were producing this map. Um, it was required under Local Law 60 and 64 of 2017. I also had the honor of helping to write those laws. Um, and it took an incredible coalition to get them passed. So this map is the start of a new New York, a fairer, better, greener, and more equitable New York because it is the roadmap for the plan. Right? We're not stopping with a map saying, here, look, this is all the injustice. Now the city has to use this to make a plan, a plan for change and a plan for dismantling the system and building a fairer one. So things are changing across the states. Um, these are just, this is just an example of some of the uh, really important laws that have been enacted in the past couple of years. Obviously, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which specifically has heightened protections for um, disadvantaged communities. Uh, the Constitutional Amendment, which guarantees everyone the right to clean air, clean water, and a healthful environment. Not just those with the right accent, the right complexion, the right education, the right zip code. Everyone. And the cumulative impacts law, which will start, which will take effect in 2025, is going to be one of the ways that we make that happen. So I'm almost out of time, but I'm going to run through really quickly three examples of what this looks like on the ground. So first story is about renewable rikers. Um, and I have to tell you some history in order for you to understand. It. Remember that link between asthma and involvement in the criminal justice system? This is a plan to try to address both of those things at the same time. But I have to tell you a little bit of history so you can understand it. So this guy. That's Richard Riker. Um, so my book is called The Villains, Rogues, and Heroes Behind New York's Place Names. That's a subtitle. He's the villain. Others, but he's the main villain. Um, he came from a family that grew wealthy from the stolen labor of enslaved Africans. And then he parlayed that wealth into social prominence and political influence. Um, you can't talk about structural racism in New York without mentioning him. At least I don't think you can. He was New York City's recorder, which is a municipal judge, in the decades before the Civil War. As recorder, he became infamous for abusing the Fugitive Slave Act. He not only enforced it, apparently quite willingly, to um, send people who had liberated themselves from slavery back to enslavement in the South, but with two police officers, he formed what came to be known as the Kidnapping Club. This was a scheme to grab random free Black New Yorkers off the street, deny them their right of habeas corpus so that they could prove that they were free black New Yorkers are not fugitive slaves and send them into slavery, which is why he's the villain. Um, and you know what, past is prologue because the different perspectives you see on the screen about the way white and black New York saw him during his lifetime parallel the way white and black New York saw Rikers Island as a jail. Um, you know, over-policing, mass incarceration, brutality at Rikers Island, Black New York brought, bore the brunt, while White New York largely didn't see anything amiss. And just an interesting side note, this drawn on the bottom, I'd love to include this. Um, the center in the figure is abolitionist David Ruggles of the New York Committee of Vigilance, who was one of Rikers' main antagonists. Ruggles 
reportedly personally led 600 people to freedom, including Frederick Douglass. And um, that brings us back to Lloyd Garrison because um, Lloyd Garrison's grandfather was very good friends with, um, with Frederick Douglass and, um, he, and Lloyd Garrison was raised on stories about him. So this was the first newspaper cartoon that actually depicted an actual black person rather than a caricature. It was published in 1838. Um, what you see here is Rikers Island. You can see the original island. It was originally 98 acres, and New York City bought it in 1884 from the Rikers family. And then in 1932, it became the main jail. And in between that time, the island was built out to 413 acres using uncompensated forced prison labor, which accidentally, which was actually built as one of the advantages of this project was because they wouldn't have to pay people and it gave them a place to dump Manhattan's coal ash. That's what they used to build out the island. Um, as you might imagine, it is quite toxic. And this island is toxic like by every way you could measure toxicity. In addition to the brutality that happens there, that, that occurred and continues to occur there, it off-gasses methane, it's in the flight path of LaGuardia, so the noise burden is unbearable. And virtually every person who is held there is a pretrial detainee, meaning that they have been convicted of nothing and they're there because they can't make bail. Most come from a handful of over-policed neighborhoods that are the same neighborhoods we've been looking at in all of those maps. So under the leadership of Just USA, which is headed by formerly incarcerated individuals, the case for shutting Rikers gained power. Taking to heart Frederick Douglass's message that power concedes nothing without a demand, they had an audacious demand. Shut it down. Not, let's make records more humane, right? but shut it down. And that is an important lesson. If you want sweeping change, you have to demand sweeping change. You might not get it, but for sure you're not gonna get it if it's not what you're asking for, right? Again, change the story. And I wanna emphasize that changing the story also means changing the people who are telling the story. A meaningful involvement of those directly impacted is critical to figuring out what our new stories will be. That's the case here with um, Just Leadership, uh, Just USA. And um, right, so this, this embodies that procedural idea of meaningful involvement. Then if we look at the substance, uh, this is the cover of the Littman Commission report headed by former New York Chief Judge Jonathan Littman which was tasked with investigating mass incarceration at Rikers Island. And the report called Rikers a stain on the city, and that's a quote. In the, 19, 20, the report came out in 2017 and it unequivocally called for Rikers Island to be shut. And it's a law now. Rikers Island is going to be shut in 2027. And that's where Renewable Rikers comes in. I have the privilege to work closely with the Close Rikers Coalition and environmental justice advocates to persuade the city council to enact three local laws that are collectively known as renewable rikers. The plan is to dedicate a portion of the island to large scale solar energy generation and battery storage and remove polluting infrastructure from those overburdened neighborhoods we've been looking at. And to build a modern wastewater treatment facility on the island and again, remove polluting infrastructure from those overburdened communities that we saw in all of those maps and to ensure that these changes happen with the participation and involvement of those most impacted by mass incarceration and records. Now, currently the mayor's dragging his feet, right? The 2027 is looking a little dodgy, um, but the borough-based jails, jails are being built and this will happen. Partial victory, contingent victory, but it's a victory. And the benefits are gonna flow first and foremost to the communities that were most affected by incarceration at Rikers Island, which are the same communities that are overburdened by the roads, by the power plants, by the wastewater treatment plants, by redlining. So story number two, shorter story, daylighting of Tibbetts Brook. Tibbetts Brook is a small stream, starts in Yonkers and it flows south into Van Cortland Park in the Bronx. And at what was formerly Van Cortland Lake and is now Hester and Piero's Mill Pond, renamed to honor two of the enslaved people who lived and worked there, um, it was channeled underground. You can see the concrete infrastructure. It was channeled underground more than a century ago, though that particular infrastructure doesn't date back quite that long. Why? To facilitate development 
of the surrounding land and to allow Robert Moses to construct the Major Deacon Expressway. So as a result of this decision, water from Tibbetts Brooks enters the New York City's combined sewer system um, at a really significant rate, um, millions of gallons a day. And this clean water is channeled into the wastewater treatment facility. When it rains, combination of stormwater, sewage, and the clean water from the brook overwhelm the sewer system and flow directly into the Harlem River. Needless to say, that is highly polluting and gross. It's also a huge flooding risk. This is the Major Deegan during Hurricane Ida. So in 2022, um, New York began the process of daylighting Tibbetts Brook. To take it to unbury the stream, to restore not its natural water course, which you can see there because that's those days are gone, but to at least have an above ground stream that will um, keep water out of the combined sewer stormwater system to reconnect the brook with the Harlem River. It's going to improve water quality, reduce waterborne illnesses, and it's also an opportunity to create a linear park in a community with too little green space, too much heat and too high pollution burden. So it's a win-win-win. So um, this is what it looks like now, and this is what it's projected to look like when it's done. And this project is being done with the intense uh, consultation and collaboration of the environmental justice communities who live along the route. It's really modeling best practices of how we can have make sure that communities are speaking for themselves. Last project. This one's really personal to me. This is the Ravenswood Generating Facility. It's a 2.5 gigawatt gas and oil fire power plant. It's the largest power plant in New York City, provides 20% of the city's power. It's one block from Queensbridge Houses, the largest public housing complex in the country, has a complex with well over 3,000 apartments. Every year, it spews a million tons of greenhouse gases, as well as 34,000 pounds of ammonia as well as benzene, arsenic, lead, and a host of other highly dangerous pollutants. And as you can see, it is directly adjacent to a children's playground and to Queensbridge Park more generally. So I tell you this as an academic. I've written extensively about pollution and about energy generation in New York. But for me, this is also extremely personal. This is the view from my window. The good news is that Ravenswood is being converted into renewable Ravenswood. Right? It's being converted into 100% renewable energy. They're going to decommission and demolish the existing um, gas-fired turbines. They're going to take down those stacks. And the new project's only going to operate seven acres uh, of a 27-acre facility. So the community is going to get land back. And just a couple of weeks ago, um, I was at this community meeting. They're trying to make sure that they do it with intense consultation to make sure that community needs desires and aspiration are foremost as they make the plan for what happens next on this site. It's also along the river. It could be like a spectacular, fabulous place. So I wanna end just by showing you my comic books because I love them. And um, this, these are the stories that I tell, right? I work with an unbelievably talented artist and we make these books that have been used as you heard like all over the place and it like blows my mind how far they've gone. We're telling stories about uh, communities organizing for change. And we work with kids to make these stories. So they're not like stories coming out of my head. They're stories that come out of things that happen in communities and we make them in close collaboration with the people who live in those communities. Same thing, we have an ongoing project with UNEP, with the United Nations Environmental Program to tell the stories of environmental defenders around the world and the dangers that they face. Our, our mission is to put the plight of environmental defenders on every human rights um, meeting agenda and on every environmental agenda. We'll see how we do, but I just wanna end by saying thank you. If you want the comic books, that QR code will get them for you. They're freely available for any nonprofit um, or educational use. And thank you so much for your time and your attention. And it's really been a pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'd love to answer some questions. Well, that was really an amazing lecture and, and definitely have time for, for a few questions. So uh, please raise your hand. Uh, we have microphones going around. 
you introduce yourself and what your relationship is to our community, your student, faculty member, and then uh, uh, I'll just press on, but you call on it. Really <laughs> <right. laughs> Well, someone has to ask a question for me to call. Actually, they don't. I can just call on people. <laughs> but I want. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chelsea. I'm a student here at Pace. I wanted to ask if you've seen the impact that GIS has had on environmental justice and having so much more access to this information. Oh, you know, the ability to make maps is just, like, it's so much easier than, I mean, you saw like the maps I started showing you at the beginning of the century, those were hand drawn. Somebody, I mean, it took people months to make maps. Now you can like go onto, um, you know, EPA's website and click a couple things or onto um, New York Open Access. New York has incredible open access of data. You can just to have a couple clicks and have a map that tells a story that is can be incredibly powerful if you're talking to people trying to convince them to support you know um i don't know ev chargers in your neighborhood or to um try to redesign the roads you know man a map of where people get hit by cars is an unbelievably powerful advocacy tool for trying to bring sort of safety and uh, street safety um yeah, I, I love GIS. Yeah. Ah, there you go. <laughs> you can call on everybody, Gabby. You could be here. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you pointing somewhere else? Like, <laughs> no. Sorry. sorry. I just wanted to make sure that everybody was done. Hi there, my name is Sophie Bacchus. I'm a student here at Pace Law as well. I'm a 1L. Um, as a New York resident uh, yourself, being privy to all of these wonderful changes that are happening, but also being an active participant in the, in the community, I'm sure you're aware of how divisive people can be about these huge changes that happen to such a historic and huge city such as New York City. So I'm curious about any kind of pushback or retaliation that you've seen to these plans, because while they're wonderful, I assume that they're a lot easier to explain to a community of law students and environmentalists than maybe it would just be to the average citizen of New York City. So what kind of pushback have you seen and how do you work to get over that and encourage everybody to be accepting of these wonderful plants? Uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, renewable, right, like renewable Rikers isn't, that part isn't controversial. It's the shut down the jail on Rikers Island, our penal colony that's like not in anybody's neighborhood because it's an island in the middle of the ocean and instead have borough-based jails that are actually going to get people to court on time. Maybe, you know, under New York law, the, the primary reason to hold somebody um, for pretrial is to make sure they show up for their trial. And guess who's got a really bad record of getting people to show up for their trial? Department <laughs> of Corrections. People who are released on their own recognizance show up at a much higher rate than people who are held on Rikers Island. Why? Because it's in the middle of nowhere. I live there, but it's in the middle of nowhere. It's really hard to get from there to the courts. Um, you know, you're never going to convince everybody, but I find that if you can actually have a conversation instead of a shouting match, which you can't always, but um, you know, like breaking people down into groups and looking looking at maps together and like hearing what people's concerns are. And, you know, sometimes they're like, their concerns are non-negotiable because, you know, their concern is I don't want those kind of people around me and like, too bad, you lose, right? But sometimes their concerns are real, a lot of times their concerns are about their housing values um, or about their child's safety in, in on the street. And if you start talking with people really talking with people, you often can work to a place, maybe not of agreement, but at least of mutual respect. It's not always true, and it's harder and harder as we get more and more divided, but that's what makes showing up at these community meetings more and more important. Because when you sit with people, when you eat with people, right, when you, you know, share drinks and, I mean, water drinks, I mean, not like, <laughs> um, but, you know, people can't pretend that you're like some crazy person. They have to realize that you're a neighbor who cares just as much as they do. And I think that's, I don't know, I, 
I don't have an answer to that, but there's there's not been a lot of pushback to the Tibbetts Brook project. Um, that's um, that's I think pretty much a win win win, um, and it also is all on land that is right now basically waste land that is being just neglected by um, uh, you know railroad companies and other uh, easement holders. Time for one more question. Oh, we have lots of room. <laughs> so, um, Austin Corbin would be a biggie as far as I'm concerned. Um, probably most of you haven't heard of him. Um, Austin Street in Forest Hills is named after him, and Corbin Street in Brooklyn is was named after him, but is now renamed after somebody else because he was such a bad guy. Um, so he was a he did many many things, um, but almost all of them involved land swindles. Uh, he developed Coney Island. He got the land by cheating the the town um, out of the land with the cooperation of a um, corrupt public official. He, um, you may have read about the, uh, the in the newspaper in the fall that um, the governor vetoed a plan to give state recognition to uh, an Indian tribe, um, the Manhasset, I think. Um, I'm gonna get their name wrong, I'm sorry, just because I'm not thinking about it. But right, the reason that they were dis, um, disrecognized as a tribe was because he stole their land. He, along with the guy named Benson, Hearst is named after Benson, who was his business partner, right? They um, cheated the tribe out of their land because they wanted to make a deep water port in Montauk, which was a very bad idea for a lot of reasons. Um, he also had, um, when he developed Coney Island, he built really fancy hotels there and announced to the world that, oh, by the way, no Jews are allowed in these hotels. And um, there's a famous story, I don't know if it's true, but I hope it is, that George M. Cohan, not Jewish, went there. And they saw the name, the people that saw the name and were like, oh, you know, we don't have any room. Whereas somebody else, so one of the other people realized, oh my God, they're turning away George M. Cohen. And we had to get the manager. And the manager came down and was like all smooth and said, well, you know, there's been a misunderstanding. Of course we have a room for you. We have a lovely suite. And reportedly, I really hope this is true, George M. Cohen said, well, there seem to be two misunderstandings. I, or um, you mistook me for a Jew, and I took, mistook you for a gentleman. <laughs> uh, but Austin Corbin would be up there. Um, I think that the road should be renamed in um, Forest Hills. And um, like I said, in Brooklyn, they did. They didn't want to change the name because they're like, eh, Austin Street is the name is really complicated to change it. They changed who it was named after. It's now named after a, a revolutionary war hero, a woman who was the first woman to get a military pension. Um, the fourth was tricky. Like there are a lot of people who fall into that road category. I'm trying to think like who would, I mean, Van Wick maybe, he was the first mayor of um, Unified New York. Um, he was elected, took office in 1898. As mayor, he pres presided over a number of really egregious scandals. Um, he went into the, um, the office as a, poor man, but not a rich man. Boy, did he leave as a really, really rich guy. Um, the New York Times in his obituary, where they usually try to say something nice about someone, <laughs> described him as the most corrupt mayor in New York's history. <laughs> now, he's had a lot of competition since then. Um, and also said that, um, described his administration as mired in news and luck. <laughs> I am full of like all kinds of trivia about history in New York. Yeah, with that, I'd like to thank all of you for saying you can do. Certainly, another big round of applause for Professor Bradley. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, he's giving us uh, more of a reception in the tutor room where we can discuss these issues more and have more than water drinks. If you're <laughs> Thank you so much.